From the deadliest domestic terror attack in U.S. history to storming the Capitol building, right-wing violence has raged in the U.S. for decades. The white supremacists who carry out these attacks have often received military training, either because they're veterans or were trained by one. White supremacists have also infiltrated police departments across the country, bringing that worldview to their service. So why did U.S. institutions like the military, government, and police ignore these warnings until January 6th? Hey guys, I'm Dina, and today we're going to look at the widespread problem of white supremacist infiltration among active and retired military personnel, and if anything can be done now to solve it. As of January 25th, nearly one in five people who had been charged over their alleged involvement in the Capitol attack had at some point been part of the U.S. military. The Associated Press noted that the tactics used in some elements of the Capitol mob, like this Ranger file formation, demonstrated that these rioters either had military training or had been trained by those who did. And at least 31 police officers are currently being scrutinized by their departments over suspected involvement in the riot. This didn't come out of nowhere. In 2009, the Department of Homeland Security noted that white supremacist and anti-government militia groups deliberately target veterans to access skills gained from military training and combat. DHS also reported that veterans of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan specifically had become a major target of these white supremacist recruitment efforts. And in 2011, the Justice Department found that right-wing extremists are significantly more likely than other extremists to have military experience. Those with military experience were also twice as likely to hold a leadership position within a far-right group. Then there are concerns about compromised veterans in the police force. Policing is often a favored career choice among those who've served, with almost 20% of the police force made up of vets. Now, it's important to note that the vast majority of veterans are not white supremacists or right-wing extremists, but domestic terrorism, racist violence, and war have been linked together throughout U.S. history. Surges in violence by groups like the Ku Klux Klan strongly correlate with the aftermath of wars, not just among veterans, but civilians as well. We spoke with author Rafia Zakaria, who sees the current moment as an outgrowth of the so-called War on Terror. That during the War on Terror, there was no explicit reference to whiteness or white nationalism or the fact that all the wars that the U.S. was engaged in were against brown people, brown and black people, right? This racial component was becoming more and more entrenched in the way Americans thought of the foreigner or the other. And the attitude of viewing black and brown individuals as the other is seen in police departments as well. In more than a dozen states, police officers have been found to have alleged connections to white supremacist groups. Research organizations have also found hundreds of law enforcement officials who are participating in racist, nativist, and sexist activity online. You fight for two decades against black and brown people as your enemy um, because you believe that they present a threat somehow to your homeland. And then, of course, you come back to your homeland and you're like, what are all these black and brown people doing here? Uh, I have to get rid of them. You know, I've fought this war um, to get rid of them. So, so I think that that, that that connection is, it's very integral. So by now you're probably wondering why was this white supremacist infiltration ignored for so long in both the police and military? Well, for decades, the intelligence community had actually been warning about the dangers that right-wing radicalization poses and the potential for these groups to successfully infiltrate military and law enforcement. Even other military service members and police officers have reported seeing evidence of white supremacist ties among their colleagues. And in 2019, a U.S. House Oversight Committee held the first of several hearings about this threat. White supremacists today constitute the most significant threat of domestic terror in the United States, but the federal government lacks a comprehensive and cohesive strategy for addressing the problem. Before that hearing, Representative Jamie Raskin released an unredacted FBI threat assessment. That report actually detailed the dangers presented by white supremacists who infiltrate law enforcement communities or recruit law enforcement personnel. But the report wasn't new. 
It was from 2006. It also described specific incidents of law enforcement officials cooperating with white supremacist groups. In one case, a California corrections officer collaborated with a literal Nazi prison gang and even called himself a quote, government infiltrator. We spoke to Michael German, a former FBI agent and current fellow at the Brennan Center about why this infiltration happens. You know, the, the applicant pool is infected with supporters of white supremacy and far right Nazi because our society is infected with it. Even as early as 1994, a House Armed Services Committee warned that several U.S. military bases were home to white supremacist activity. Just one year later, in 1995, this happened. About a third of the building has been blown away. Gulf War veteran Timothy McVeigh orchestrated the Oklahoma City bombing, the deadliest domestic terror attack in U.S. history. McVeigh bombed a federal building with the intention of sparking an anti-government uprising. McVeigh had been involved in white power and militia movements for years, but those ties were ignored, and he was instead portrayed as a lone wolf. And he's not the only one to be classified as such. When it is a, 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 a perpetrator of some violent event happens to be a person of color, the government is very quick to uh, uh, blame it on a larger group of people or people who share an ideology or a political goal. Uh, but when it's a white perpetrator, even if their connections to white supremacist organizations or far-right militant groups are very clear in public, uh, the, the FBI and, and state and local law enforcement tend to treat that as a standalone offense. And, and that undermines our ability to understand the organized nature of the criminality. Uh, and, and address the problem more uh, systemically. One incident from the early Obama years shows the importance of keeping tabs on white supremacist organizing and the dangers of ignoring these groups. Remember that 2009 DHS report we mentioned earlier? Well, its warnings were ignored and its findings were immediately politicized by, you guessed it, the Republican Party. When you, uh, when you look at this uh, report on uh, right-wing extremists, uh, it includes, uh, you know, includes about two thirds of Americans uh, who, uh, you know, who might go to church, uh, who uh, uh, may have served in the military, uh, who may be involved in community activities. This is it's bizarre. In response, DHS Secretary Janet Napolitano disavowed the report and apologized to veterans. Then, a DHS unit investigating right-wing extremism was largely dismantled. This meant that no one at DHS was keeping tabs on the white power movement's growth or its effort to strengthen ties with military and law enforcement. And then in 2017, this happened. I, Donald John Trump, do solemnly swear. Once Trump took office, there was little hope in tackling the issue of white supremacy. Just days after being inaugurated, his administration rescinded a grant to Life After Hate, an organization focused on de-radicalizing white supremacists. The number of hate groups grew under Trump, hitting a record high of 1,020 in 2018. By 2020, that number was down to 838, but this is still alarmingly high. With Trump in office, white supremacist groups, which had largely been hiding in the deep recesses of the internet, began spilling out into the real world most notably in Charlottesville in August 2017. You will not replace us! Then again at the Capitol on January 6. The right-wing extremists who stormed the Capitol had been repeatedly incited by Trump and members of the Republican Party to reject the results of the 2020 election, and by extension, the votes from black urban communities that ensured Trump's defeat. So what happens now? The military and law enforcement need to be more vigilant and consistent in screening potential recruits for white supremacist ties. They, they normally do some background investigations. It's just not clear that they're looking for this particular issue, right? This has been a problem in the military too. And whenever there's a problem, like you'll see now that the military will do a purge, but then when they're not meeting their recruiting numbers, you'll see those standards start to slip again. Now, for the first time, this year's defense spending bill requires the Pentagon's annual workplace survey to ask service members if they've encountered white supremacy and racism. Michael German says that police departments can also root out right-wing extremists by simply listening to their colleagues. I think it's, it's a, a mistake to assume that identifying these, these racist, white supremacists and far-right militants in law enforcement is some Herculean task. 
uh, the people who work with them on a daily basis, and that includes their fellow officers and FBI agents that often work hand in glove with local police agencies, know who the problems are. There's now a big debate over the best way to deal with the problem of white supremacy. Some are advocating new domestic terror laws, while others are pushing back, saying that the legal tools to deal with white supremacy already exist. The attack on the Capitol brought all these issues to the fore, but it's important to remember that white supremacist violence isn't new, and everyday Americans have been dealing with it for a long time, both from explicitly racist groups and from implicitly racist institutions like the police. We have to understand that these groups were attacking communities all across the country, but those communities don't have the same political status as our, our members uh, of Congress. And so we're seeing it now for the first time, but there have been communities that have been suffering under this violence for a long time.